And that is a true statement. All of the ground is sinking sand. And I hope you've learned in your lives that when we put our trust in anything or anyone else other than the Lord Jesus Christ, it will always let us down. But he never will. Our missionary moment is now and our time for giving is up is now. If, um, our passage in focus this, this month has been Proverbs chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. Um, Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase, so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. The con- I was thinking about this uh, concept of honor this week and what does it mean to honor someone? Uh, it means to give proper deference and respect to them for who they are. Uh, we tell the Bible commands children to honor their parents. By the way, you never outgrow that command, whether you're married or not, um, whether you've left a home or not, whether they deserve it or not, because you're honoring a position. Here we are honoring someone who not only deserves it, um, and also is the God who made us, and who gives us all things so that we can give some back to him so that he can bless us. That's an amazing concept to me. The missionary in focus, one of them is here, Brother John, his wife is, I don't know, where's your wife at tonight? Okay, she's in Sparks. His wife is working in the Sparks. Isn't that wonderful? With, with the children down there. They work with the Navigators Ministry uh, here right on, on base in Jacksonville. Um, if, you're never, if you've never looked into the Navigators, Google it. Um, read, read about a man named Dawson Trotman and his um, desire for discipleship. And actually how he died at a young age is trying to, to save someone. Um, just a wonderful man that we don't hear about a lot. We make heroes, football stars, and, and all these, but the real heroes are men like Dawson and, and people who are serving the Lord in the difficult ministry of discipleship. Um, and God has blessed, uh, and I've had many lunches with Brother John and, and discussions. I'm, I'm just glad we're able to partner together and to um, be a part of your ministry, brother. I was a Marine. And I got saved through a ministry I was a young single Marine, and we called it the GI Fellowship. It was a bunch of guys just hanging out together, and girls, that's where I met my wife. Um, but there's a huge need for um, not only the fellowship aspect, but the growth, growing aspect of, of, um, of discipleship amongst the military. So I'm thankful for what you do, and we want to pray for you. And if you haven't, if you want to read more about it, if you walk outside the board right here, but you're, you are our missionary in focus this month, your family is, so you can read about our world famous DJ right here, because he, he does podcasts and other things you can read about. Just trying to whet your appetite, I'm not going to tell you all, just go look at it. But God, is, God has a, a very world famous DJ in our own midst here. So, Lord, thank you for the Martin family and their service to your kingdom. Thank you, Lord, that we can come alongside and help them in that ministry. Lord, we thank you for the privilege of giving, and Lord, not just our, our, our finances that you've given us, but of our time and our talents so that we can further the kingdom of God. We ask that we continue to bless and encourage them in their service and help us to serve you well. And Lord, we, we have asked as you open our eyes as we look at your word tonight so that we can understand the truths, so that we can live them and glorify you uh, better. And we ask this in your name. Amen. Revelation chapter 3. We are in church 6 out of 7 as we work our way through the book of Revelation. Just to give you a quick outline of Revelation. In chapter 1, uh, John sees a vision of the glorified Lord and an angel comes to him and says, I want you to write letters to seven churches. And in chapters 2 and 3, we're introduced to these seven churches. We're on the sixth of them. When we get to chapter 4, we're going to move from earth to heaven. And we're going to see the, the Father in heaven. And he's going to be praised because he's the creator. In chapter 5, we're going to see the Son in heaven. And he's going to be praised because he's the Redeemer. And he's going to be given a scroll. And in that scroll, there are seven seals. And those, as he begins to open up the seals, we're going to see various judgments happen. And you're going to have seal judgments, bowl judgments, and trumpet judgments from chapter 6. To chapter 19, we're going to have uh, basically all hell on earth is going to begin to develop. It's going to be a mess. But it's a plan. God's got a plan, and, we'll, and we go through that, we'll walk. 
You'll notice from the time we finish uh, next week talking about the church at Laodicea, that the church will not again be mentioned until we get to the end of the book. The church, right now we're in the church age, and as we look at each of these seven churches, they were real literal churches. They really existed, they really had these problems, and they represent the types of churches and Christians throughout the church age. I pray that we are more like the church of Philadelphia than some of these other churches, like Thyatira and Pergamum. That's the goal. And I'm hoping as we've gone through this, you say, boy, there's a good thing to focus in on, and here's something we've got to be careful of, like losing our first love but doing all the right things. Um, but just wanted you to kind of give you a big outline as, as we work through it. And today we're going to look at a church, and I put this in your notes, um, that is just doing well. It's very rare when God comes in and does an assessment and you get, a, you get A's on everything. Now, they weren't perfect. There aren't any perfect people, so there aren't any perfect churches. But when God assessed them, he said, you guys are doing it the right way. Chuck Swindoll said, and this is in your notes in the first paragraph, the size of the congregation, the limitations of its location, or the restrictions of its budget should never determine its vision. Instead, churches should set their vision based on the power of God. God is infinite, magnificent, awesome, and mighty, beyond description or comprehension. When he chooses to open opportunities, the possibilities are endless. All we need to do is trust and follow him wherever he leads. There are no small churches in God's eyes. God can, and we're going to see this. This church in Philadelphia is small in number but they're mighty in power. So don't ever say, well, we're small, or we're just in Jacksonville, or we're just, we're nobodies, because, you know, that's not how God works. In fact, God often uses the insignificant to bring glory so that he gets the glory. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Very clear on that. Not many wise, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God chooses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. So, of all the churches that we've run into, this is the first church that I actually knew the name of and what it meant. Philadelphia. We have that city in our country, the city of brotherly love. I remember the first time I went there for a chess tournament. Saw uh, a mugging. Almost got knifed. And there's a lot of brotherly love that was shown. Now, I'm not picking on that city because all cities, because they have a lot of people in them, not everyone in there is going to be godly. And as we see this city, uh, we're going to learn some things about them. By the way, that's what God wants us to be. Have love one towards another as brothers and sisters. And look at our backgrounds. We've got people here from the north and the south. We've got people here whose football teams are mortal enemies. We've got a Washington Redskins. I'm not going to call them the football team. Uh, fan back there in the booth. And we've got a Philadelphia Eagles fan right there and a New York Giants fan right here. Anybody going to claim Dallas? Get the whole NFC East? Okay. Okay. Got the whole NFC East in here, and we all coexist in, in the same room. And we can probably go other sports, other likes and dislikes. We had Auburn and Alabama working together back in the, the, the sound booth. Now, that's like a miracle. There, were no, there was no blood, no foul. How does that happen amongst Christians? Because God is our unifying force. <coughs> He's the one <coughs> who does it. And so what I'd like to do is starting in verse 7, just read down to verse 13. And let's be encouraged tonight. Rather than just, you know, I don't know about you, but some of these messages, I, I walk away like, God, leave me alone. It's like messing with me again. But here's an encouraging message. And we need these every once in a while too. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you 
Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. As we've been doing in all of these, I want to, say, I want to start with who the author is, who the Christ of the Church of Philadelphia is. Because he, in each of the churches, he represents himself by different names. It's interesting, he never says, I'm Jesus, and I'm writing the ch- to the church. Now, in chapter 1, we, got, we were introduced to him, but every time he writes a church, he gives a description of himself. And there's a fourfold description here, and each of these description has, descriptions has to do with Jesus' character. And this is an Old Testament uh, focus. In the first five churches that we looked at, the description went back to chapter 1 and pulled out some aspect of that, of that glorified Jesus that we spent time on looking at. Here is a little different. He starts out by saying, he who is... Holy. Obviously, that's God. He's the only one who has absolute holiness. The Old Testament repeatedly calls God the Holy One. 2 Kings 19.22, Job 6.10, Psalm 71.22, and other verses. Isaiah says, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. Next, a couple weeks from now, when we get to chapter 4, next chapter, we're going to see That's what the angels around the throne are saying, that God is holy. Now, when we say someone or something is holy, it means it's separate. Uh, I'm I'm studying for next week's Sunday school class, and we're looking at Leviticus. When they bring the offerings, they say, whatever this offering touches becomes holy. What it means is whatever that offering touches becomes separated to God. This is called a sanctuary. It means it's set apart to God. There's nothing special about the... They didn't get blessed, special iron when they, when they drove this stuff into the ground. And we got holy... Well, we might have some holes on the carpet, but that's not the kind of holy we're talking about. But it's set apart, set a, a, aside for a specific purpose. My wife has a holy room. It's called her quilting room. And woe be to you if you go in there and start turning things around, messing things up. I know because I just like doing things like that. It's not a good thing. That's her area. I get my little table, then I get this little square, four by four square, that's mine. The rest of the house, her, set apart for her. She's not mean, I'm just using an example there. The title, the Holy One, is used throughout the the New Testament to refer to Jesus. So the reason I bring this up is the Old Testament, very clearly the Jews knew that God the Father was being focused on. In the New Testament, Jesus takes the same title to himself. Hence, Jesus is God. And we see that just by this introductory statement. Mark 1.24, when a terrified demon saw Jesus, he said, what business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us before the time? I know who you are the Holy One of Israel. When a demon saw holiness, he was terrified. Announcing his birth to Mary, the angel described Jesus as the Holy Child, Luke 1.35. In John chapter 6, verse 69, when Peter said, We have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Later, when he's preaching in Acts chapter 3, he tears into the unbelieving Jews because they disown the holy and righteous one and ask for a murderer to be granted to them. So Jesus is holy. It's the same title used of the Father in the Old Testament. He's claiming to be God. And by the way, because Jesus is holy, you say, well, I know that, Mark. Obviously, he's God. Guess what he tells us? Be ye holy, for I am holy. God. So Jesus didn't save us just to give us a get out of hell free card. Because if he did that, he could have just taken us and zipped us straight to heaven. 
He saved us from the penalty of sin when the, when we, the moment we trust Christ, called justification. He is currently saving us from the power of sin in our lives through the sanctification process as we hear the word of God, as we sing songs about and, and worship to the, to the Lord, as we pray, as we fellowship, as we give, as we witness, as we grow, we become more and more like the image of Christ, Romans 8, 29. And then someday he will save us from the very presence of sin when we die physically and we get zipped up to heaven and he's going to give us a new incorruptible body. And so the goal while we're on this earth is to be holy, set apart to God. Not only is he holy here, he is called true. And I, I like how truth and holiness are combined here. Uh, in Revelation chapter 6, verse 10, and I'm not going to rush through this. I'm probably going to spend two weeks on this lesson. So, And they cried with a loud voice, talking about the, the martyrs who were under, this is the fifth seal, who were under the, under the altar. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood? See, see how holy and true are combined there. Also in chapter 15 of Revelation, and the reason I'm showing you this is I'm trying to get you to see the character of God, because when we get to the tribulation period, it's going to be pretty scary. And some people are going to say, well, how can a good God do this? A good God can do this because he's holy, and he's true, and he must judge sin. And we're going to see examples of people over and over again, knowing it's God judging, shaking their fist at God, saying, hide us from the wrath of the Lamb who is up there trying to get us. Uh, Revelation uh, 15, 3. They, sang, they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of a Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Chapter 16, verse 7. And I heard another voice from the altar saying, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. Chapter 19, verse 2. I had fun with some word studies this week. For true and righteous are his judgments, because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication, and he has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. And also in that chapter, drop down to verse 11. Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness or holiness he judges and makes war. Big idea from this. He's holy and he's true. And what does it mean to be holy and true? He's, what you see is what you get. There's no shadow of falsehood. It's like bright light. You ever see something that you, you kind of think it's one thing? Like when I was stationed in the desert, and we were driving down the road, and you see these mirages, and you think something's there, and it's not. That's not Jesus. He's true. What you see is what you get. He's authentic. He is who he says he is. The word means genuine, authentic, and real. And when we're going to deal in the rest of this book, we're going to see that which is the exact opposite. What he judges is not real, it's fake. It's hypocritical. It's self-righteous. It's unholy. And I'm glad that we have a God who is holy and true and understands who we really are. The third thing we see here is he has the key of David. There's another, um, well, look at Revelation 5.5. I'm going to give you a couple spots here to show. This is a re reference to Jesus' office as the Messiah. Messiah is an Old Testament term. Uh, and the New Testament word is Christ. Jesus Christ, Jesus Messiah. Christ is not his name, it's his title. It'd be like the John Musician. Or John Marine. So it's a, it's a title. Jesus Messiah, Jesus the one who will redeem his people. Chapter 5, verse 5. But one of the elders said, Do not weep. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has prevailed to open the scrolls and to loose the seven seals. Notice the reference back to David. Um, also in chapter 22, all the way to the last chapter of this book, verse 16, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and offspring of David, 
the bright and morning star. You say, Mark, why is that important? Way back in the Old Testament, let's go back to Genesis. God makes a, co uh, a covenant, an unconditional covenant with a man named Abraham and, sa and says this, from you, Abraham, I will bless all the nations of the earth. Look at the stars, look at the sand. You, you can't even count them. Now, this is interesting because Abraham was old and childless. And yet God kept his word. And that, passed, that promise passed on to his son Isaac and to his son, his son Jacob. And all the way down through the Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And God, keeping that promise, delivers the people out of the land of Egypt over 400 years later, brings them into the promised land. They have several judges, and that doesn't work very well. They, they rebel, and they say, we want a king, so he gives them King Saul. That doesn't work very well. He raises up a man after his own heart named David. And from David in 2 Samuel 7, uh, he gives David a promise. It's called the Davidic covenant. That from David's line, the line of Judah, the Messiah would be born. And when you get to the New Testament, you look at Matthew's gospel, you look at Luke's gospel, Matthew 1, Luke 3, and you follow those genealogies, you're going to see through the line of Joseph, and through the line of Mary, they both trace back to David. Why is that important? If Jesus was not born from the line of David, he could not be the Messiah. He could not be the one who kept that prophecy. And by the way, you say, well, Jesus controlled all his stuff when he was on earth, so he just manipulated things. You can't control where you're born, what your lineage is, what cities your parents go from and to before you're born, unless you're God. And he was able to do that. So when he says he has the key of David, uh, key in Scripture represents authority. If I have a key, I can walk in and, and, and into my house. I have the key to my house, I can get in. If you don't have the key to my house, you're intruding if you try to come in. He has the authority. Uh, he has the control to do that. Just wanted you to see. What does he have the keys to, by the way? Go back to chapter 1, verse 18. We're going to do a little bit of Bible drill today. Chapter 1, verse 18. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and death. You know what he's saying? I was dead. I'm alive. I'm living forever. And I've just proved that I've conquered. I have authority over death and the grave. I've got it. This is the Jesus who's talking to this church. And the fourth way he identifies himself he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. If you're holy and true and you have keys, but you don't have any power, what good is it? Someone could overpower you. So here's a picture of his, uh, his power, his omnipotence. It's a fancy word for all-powerful. If he opens the door, ain't nobody closing it. If he closes the door, bad English, ain't nobody opening it. But that's the truth. All the way through Scripture, you see this, especially in the book of Job. Um, where were you when I did this, and when I built these stars, and I did this? Who can stop God from doing what he's going to do? And the, no one can. And so we have a God who is holy, who is true, has authority, and has power. And that's how he introduces himself to this church. Now, I'd be a little scared if somebody opened up with an introduction, because we've seen how he's introduced himself to all the other churches. Pretty similar, right? I'd be like, oh, what's going to happen now? What did we do? Let's look at this church at Philadelphia. Verse 7 there. We don't know much about it. It's not mentioned in Scripture, other than in this spot right here. When... Paul was on his missionary journeys in Acts 19 when he spent a couple of years in Ephesus. It says that the gospel went out from there, and we know that it did. Um, and and, the, and if, if the, do you have that map again, brother? Outstanding, Mark. I bet you can't do that. No, just let it go. We'll, we'll get it later. It's not worth. Not we're on we're on the, on the line here. So, do you have the map of the of the uh, seven cities? Thanks. So when he's in Ephesus for three years. The gospel goes out all the way through Asia. And if you'll notice where Philadelphia is, it goes up to Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis. It's about 30 miles from Sardis. It's an inland route. It's up on top of a hill. It's like an 800-foot overlook 
looking down right there, it's a well-designed, well-built area for protection. Thank you. That's the Hermes Valley. Um, it's the youngest of these seven cities, founded somewhere around 189 B.C. by either King Eumenes of Pergamum or his brother Attalus. They liked each other, and so it was called Brother Lover. That's the, the city. So that was based on two brothers that liked each other. One, one finished, the other one took over his spot. That's, that's how much... Um, that, I mean, it, it must have been a pretty impressive love to name after your brother. It was considered the gateway to the east. One of the problems, though, if you ever lived in California, you know this problem, earthquakes. Don't matter what you build your city on, how high it is, if an earthquake comes, guess what happens to your city? It collapses. And this underwent several various earthquakes over time. In the year 17 uh, AD, an earthquake, oh, I wasn't looking, but thank you, brother. An earthquake hit Philadelphia and leveled it. And it also hit Sardis and 10 other cities nearby. The emperor, Caesar Tiberius, gave the cities money to rebuild. And so Philadelphia was very happy about that. And they changed their name to Neo Caesarea for several years. New Caesar. And then... They changed it again based on the new emperor. You know, I mean, if you want to stay, in, if you want to stay uh, happy with the emperor, just keep changing your name. They'll, they'll, somebody will like you. Politicians like it when their name's involved somehow. And so they changed it again and to the name Flavia after, after Emperor Flavius. And so for the second and third centuries, this church continued. This church is going to last a little bit longer than the other cities. We, we have its history a little bit longer. And I think it's because they had such a solid testimony. In verses 8 to 11, we're going to see four realities that characterize the congregation. Verse 8, I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door and no one can shut it. Remember he said, I'm the one who can open and not shut it? So he says, I, this, I know it. It's open. And here's why. You have a little strength, a little power. Now, when you use the word little, you're like, oh, you only got a little bit. So you're not very strong. What he's saying here is not a negative comment. It's a positive comment. They're very small in number, and they have an impact way beyond their numbers. I think the opposite is true of churches in America. Millions of people call themselves Christians, but we have very little influence on society. Here's a little group of believers who had a big impact. It reminds me of Paul's statement in 2 Corinthians 12. I am well content with weaknesses, insults, distresses, persecutions, difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Because they were small, because they were uh, small in numbers and had little physical power, they had to rely upon the power of God in order to succeed. Secondly, we see that they were obedient. You have kept my word. Now that's a really simple statement. Uh, one of the things I'm doing this year for an exercise is I'm actually writing out the book of Revelation. If you've never done that before, if you haven't handwritten in a while, you're not writing it all out at once, I'll tell you that. I do six or seven verses at a time. But I remember when I was going through this, it just kind of made me stop. They kept my word. That's a really strong statement. You're obedient. You love me enough to keep my word. Isn't that what Jesus said? If you love me, you do what? Keep my commandments. They're demonstrating their love because they're obedient. Isn't that what we always want for our children? They say, I love you, Mom. I love you, Dad. But I'm not going to clean my room. Oh, and they don't say that, but they don't do what you ask them to do. And then we, I have my grandkids stay with me all week. And it's quite an interesting uh, change for them. But they, my youngest, Mia, three years old and is cute and knows it, tries to do the I'm cute and I'm not going to obey thing. I'm like, I love you, pops. No, you don't. You're not obeying me. Do what I say. That's kind of the, the mindset here. God said, you know what? You are obedient. We need to be like Martin Luther when he was on trial, who said, my conscience is captive to the word of God. What do we get our philosophy of life from? Is it 
from Christ, the solid rock that we stand, and all other ground is sinking sand? Or do we mix it with the world's philosophy, the Constitution, um, what I like and don't like, well, my personal favorites and this kind of thing, and just kind of mix this all up together and say, this is how I build my life, golden crayon theology. Or is it totally based on what God says? They had a pattern of obedience, and I think we need to have the same thing. Third, they were commended for not having denied his name, although they were pressured to do so. Remember, they live in a, in a town that named itself after the, the emperor. And what did the Caesars say that they had to do once a year? Every person in his kingdom had to do once a year. Had to bow down and say, Caesar is God. And they refused to do it. We saw this in earlier churches where people were martyred for this. For not doing that. Here was a church that was pressured. We're seeing this in our society now. What was standard, basic common sense in law 50 years ago is now considered hate speech. If you read the old DSM, 3 and 4, homosexuality was considered, at best, a mental uh, deficiency. Now, if you say homosexuality is sin, you're the one that has the problem. And on and on and on. Society does not like God's standards. We see this with the whole Roe v. Wade thing that's going on right now. Look at the news coverage of it. Read the articles. It's fascinating to me to see how the world just totally uh, repackages and reinvents facts just to match what they want to have happen. Amen, right? Somebody's got a phone going. It's not me. I hope it's not in the water there that I just dumped. Is somebody having a hard time letting that water just sit there? I know. I am too, but we've got to do what we've got to do. We're online, so God's word is more important. We'll get that cleaned up. I'll just tell John I washed the stage for him and we watered the plants. So, Finally, he says, you've kept my command to persevere. You've kept my command to endure patiently, the way the NIV puts it. Here's, the, here's where it, it's really easy to obey God when no one's pressuring you, when everybody agrees with you. It's like when I, I, I do a Wednesday night class, on, we have a marriage class next door, and we have couples, and we're talking about the women's role to submit. I said, it's really easy to submit when I agree with my husband. It's very difficult to submit when you disagree with somebody. That's not submission. If I agree and you agree, big deal. We're just doing the same thing. If I have a boss that I, that I disagree with, but I'm supposed to submit to, that, that's challenging. They are being pressured from without, saying, y'all need to change your views. And they submit to God's word instead and say, no, we're in the minority. We're, we know that it's not popular, but we're going to do what God says. God's word is and views are never going to be in the minority, excuse me, in the majority in this society. Never. Until he comes and rules and reigns, at least on the outside, people will obey. But we're going to see this at the end of the millennial reign in, in Revelation 20, when the devil is bound for a thousand years and he's let loose for a little season, then millions will come and follow the devil. Even though Jesus is ruling with a rod of iron. And why is that? Because it's a heart problem. People do not want to obey God who don't believe God. What you see from this church is some wonderful promises. First, he puts an open door which no one can shut. Their salvation is secure. By the way, if you're a believer, so is yours. Because God doesn't give you temporary eternal life. The word everlasting, it's really, if you look it up in the Greek, you know what it means? Everlasting. And your salvation is not based on anything you did anyway. If it was, it would not be everlasting. Because we met, if you read the Bible from Genesis chapter 3 to the end, one thing you're going to find out is that man can sin. In any situation, any, any spot, and I use mankind in general, we can jack it up. We jack up the Garden of Eden, my goodness. That's perfection. We jacked it up when we're going by our own conscience, when we, had, when we had God's law, when we had a monarchy, when we had people just doing what they wanted to do. We met, we're messing it up on the grace. We're going to mess it up under Jesus himself, ruling on the, on the planet for a thousand years. 
Because the problem is always a heart problem. Jesus says, you know what? I'm going to open this door and no one can shut it. You are in. And that's a big deal. Because when you're being persecuted, when you're going through all this, we've just got to see ourselves as passing through. We're here temporarily. This is not our home. We're sojourning, I think is what one translation uses. And we're TAD, if you want to use the military, or TDY, if you want to use the, the Air Force semi-military version of that. Sorry, my wife's going to get me for that one later. Now, when you see a door, that kind of jumps out at me. An open door that no one can shut. Now, when, when we get to the next church at Laodicea, he's going to stand at the door and knock. But you're on, with a door, you're on one side or you're on the other. There's no in-between. You're not in the door. You're on the left side or the right side or whatever way, whatever way it's facing. And, and doors to me are a symbol of I'm from this spot to this spot. I'm, I've left the world and now I'm going to heaven. That door's staying open. I'm, I'm, on, I'm on the path right now and I'm continuing to go. The, the most popular book ever written aside from the Bible is Pilgrim's Progress. And if you've ever read it, um, if you haven't read it, you should read it. But if you've read it, you know what I'm talking about. You look at Pilgrim's journey as he goes through the Christian life. It's a process. Second promise we see here. This one's an interesting. I'm going to cause those of the synagogue of Satan, who say they are Jews and are not, but lie, I will make them come and bow down at your feet and make them know that I have loved you. If you remember back in Smyrna in chapter 2, Christians in Philadelphia uh, faced the same kind of hostility that, the, that they face in that church. There was a Jewish local contingent which said, Jesus is not Lord. And for you claiming him to be Lord, we're going to make your life miserable. But look at this promise here. There's going to be some Jews who will come and bow in front of the, they're going to become believers and they're going to say, you were right. That's an interesting promise. To me, at least. Now, Paul defines a true Jew, Romans chapter 2, verse 28, for he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision with that which is outward in the flesh, but he's a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter, and his praise is not from men, but of God. And so there were some, some of the very Jews who were persecuting them would come and bow down and, and let them know that God, God's word is true. They were saved. And, and because of the strong uh, testimony that this little church had, they were going to affect the unbelievers who are prosecuting them and persecuting them in such a way that they want to become a believer. Now, I want you to think about that. When's the last time someone even knew that you were a Christian, number one, or was it actually influenced by your Christianity in such a way that they wanted to at least ask questions about it? But look at the strength of their testimony. They wanted to know about this Jesus that they served. I'm not sure if I have time to hear this last promise here. I'm going to introduce us to this last promise. Uh, because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I will also keep you from the hour of testing, the hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Now, when we first started the book of Revelation... I spent four weeks going over some preliminary stuff. And if you remember, I gave you a handout. And in that handout, it discussed the different views on the tribulation period, the millennial reign, all those kinds of things. Now, when I say the tribulation period, it's a seven-year period we're going to see from Revelation chapter 6 to Revelation chapter 19. That's a fulfillment of the 70 weeks of Daniel, Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27, where God promised 70 weeks. In fact, we're going to begin that tonight, just to reintroduce that to you, and I'll jump into this promise next time, because there's so much to talk about. So take your Bible, please, and turn back to Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. I wasn't planning on doing this, but that's all right. Now, this is all leading up to the fourth promise that God is going to protect the Church of Philadelphia from. Daniel 9, 24. Seventy weeks, or literally seventy sevens, are determined for, this is talking to Daniel, for your people, your holy city. 
Now, who is the people of Daniel? The Jews. What's the holy city? Jerusalem. And here's the, what's going to happen when these 70 weeks are done. To finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and promise. That means to fulfill all the, pro the, the prophecies that God made. And to anoint the most holy. So when, the, when these 70 works are, weeks are done, God's done. Everything he said is going to come true. When we get to the end of Revelation, we're going to see all this stuff is done. Okay? Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks, or 69 weeks. I don't know why. I never figured out why he just said 70 weeks, or 69, but he did. 69 weeks. So we know the date when the command was given by Cyrus to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem that were torn down 70 years earlier by the Babylonians. We know that date. We know the date that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. And I know you're going to be shocked that 69 times 7, or 483 Jewish years, based on a 360-day calendar, to the day, it's exact. So my little brain says, if the first 69 weeks were exactly seven years each, then what do you think the last one is going to be? Seven years. You may hear that called the tribulation. Uh, and then when we get to the tribulation, we're going to talk about it's broken into two halves. The first three and a half will be relative peace compared, and then the last three and a half is literally all hell on earth where everything just breaks down, okay? But that's where I get this from. After the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself, he's going to be killed, okay? And the people, the prince who is to come, they shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. If you're familiar with history, 70 AD, what happens to the city of Jerusalem? It's destroyed. And then you just keep on reading it. And when we get to later on in Revelation, I'm going to refer back to here and show you about the coming Antichrist and, and all the things that are going to be. But let me just show you. Just, I'm just going to skim over it, okay? Um, verse 27, Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for a week. This is talking about the uh, Antichrist. But in the middle of the week he shall bring an end uh, to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. Now, that doesn't mean a whole lot until you... It's like looking at a negative of an old Polaroid. Until you get the real picture and you start matching the two, you'll see where it's all going to fit. Now, why do I bring this up? Some commentators try to say that the promise to the church at Philadelphia is that they are going to not suffer. Period. Physically. Physically. The problem is, Jesus just said, what were they doing? Suffering physically because they were being persecuted. And so if, if I look at that, we'll go back to Revelation chapter 3, verse 10, and I'm just going to introduce us and we'll finish it next time. Uh, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world. So big idea there. I will, that's future tense, correct? The test of future. It's for a definite limited time, the hour so it's, it's a small period of time. Um, it's a trial or a test that will expose people for what they really are. The time of testing. Okay. If the test is worldwide in scope, it will come upon the whole world. And finally, most significantly, its purpose is to test those who dwell on the earth. Now next week I'm going to take you through several passages of Scripture in the book of Revelation and to show you that the people who dwell on the earth is a, is a euphemism for unsaved people. I'm going to show you six or seven examples of that in the book of Revelation. So what he's saying here is, I'm going to keep you, because you've already been tested in past, from going through the trials, the tribulation, that I'm going to be bringing on these guys. And that is a great promise, not only to that church, but to all churches. And I'll, I'll expand that more next week. Father, thank you for your word and what you've taught us tonight. Thank you for the example of the church at Philadelphia and for the many men and women who are like that, uh, even here at Centerview. Help us to aspire to be like these men and women who, who live in a way that brings honor and glory to you. 
And we ask this in Jesus' name.